2020, the year of the coronavirus pandemic, is quickly coming to an end. In this video, we're going to review trends related to the political situation, the economy, and class struggle, and discuss what might be in store for the coming period. With the depression caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, there was a huge increase in public spending by the major capitalist governments to soften its impact, especially on businesses and, to a lesser extent, on workers. The International Monetary Fund projects that the global economy will shrink by 4.4% this year, while in 2009, according to the same agency, it fell by 0.1%. The IMF estimates that fiscal and monetary Stimulus in advanced economies has been around 20% of their total gross domestic product. In middle-income countries, it was only 6 to 7%. When developing and dependent countries, the reaction has been much, much more modest. Together, they injected the equivalent of 2% of their GDP. This leaves them much more vulnerable to a prolonged recession, which could throw millions into poverty. The IMF itself has provided $100 billion in emergency loans, and the World Bank has set aside $160 billion. According to the Institute of International Finance, in the markets of the main capitalist countries, the debt exceeded more than four times the world's GDP in the third quarter of 2020. This enormous increase in public and private debt was not intended for investment, but for speculation. A repurchase of shares led to the stock markets being the only area where pre-pandemic values were exceeded, Governments and central banks have the difficult task of containing spending and preventing these bubbles from bursting. What is the status of the world economy? We spoke with Michael Roberts, a renowned Marxist economist, author of several books such as Marx 200 and The Long Depression. But in order to get through this pandemic, huge amounts of money printing has taken place by central banks and governments. Uh, central banks and banks have handed out with government guarantees huge amounts of loans, at least in the advanced uh, capitalist countries. Trillions of dollars have been handed out either to just give a few paychecks to people to keep them going, but mainly to try and support small businesses and in particular large businesses from going completely bust. Now, one of the theses I put forward in my view is that if that debt can only be financed and maintained, if companies make sufficient profits. There's continual contradiction between trying to try for individual capitalists trying to increase their profits, but at the same time, it leads actually to a general fall in the profitability of capital over time. This is a theory that Marx presented to explain crisis under capitalism. There's a tendency for the profitability to capital to fall over time. And despite the efforts of capitalists, individual capitalists, to boost their own profits, the, the capitalist system doesn't sustain that profitability. Now, profitability on a global scale, and in countries like Argentina, Brazil, and elsewhere, is at an all-time post-war low. So you've got very big debts and low profitability. That is a recipe, possibly for next year, of a serious credit crunching. We already know that there's something like 20 to 25% of companies on average now who are not earning enough profit to even cover the interest on the cost that they have to pay on their existing debt. We call these zombie companies. Now. They're not dead, they've not gone bust, but they're not living, they're not growing. They're uh, the undead. Uh, and, and this is the situation in the whole sector of the corporate sector. And that, so we're going to enter a period, it seems to me, either, both of low growth, uh, poor recovery, from the slump that we've got, even if vaccines work, and the possibility of some sort of credit crunch and financial crisis as we go through 2021. In the face of an unprecedented economic crisis, what might happen in the coming year, especially for the working class? The companies will go to the wall. Uh, the banks have got quite a lot of money because the central banks have been printing money so that we won't have a banking crash like we had in 2008-9, but we could have a corporate credit crunch where a lot of companies go to war. Maybe uh, that will be allowed to happen. If it was allowed to happen, it would be disastrous for millions of people 
for their jobs and incomes and so on. But from the point of view of capitalism, that is quite a good way of getting out of a crisis. Just put people on the, on, on, make them unemployed, close down all the rotten companies, just leave the big, efficient, uh, profitable companies left, and they can then move into the space left by the weaker, weaker com companies and replace them, and you get a new boom in capital. That's one possibility. I think that's probably unlikely, even if there is a collapse in a load of smaller companies, I think it seems that governments and central banks don't want that sort of solution, which was often suggested in the 1930s as a solution uh, and operates it. What they want is to try and keep these companies going, keep the zombie companies more or less going, not let them collapse, uh, and hope that the economy, the world economy will pick up again and eventually uh, the capitalism will survive this crisis. Then what we'll see is very slow growth. Unemployment, which has risen during the slump this year, will not go down very quickly, if at all. Uh, wages will remain very uh, weak. There won't be much growth in wages. Uh, people will be struggling. Uh, the governments will, uh, will try to get some of this money back that they've spent through higher taxation or making further cuts in public spending, the sort of thing we've seen over the last 10 years, really. Capitalism is in the position where it's got such low profitability and high debts, it can't get out of this crisis. The only way it can get out was such a severe slump that it would completely alter the ratio of good companies and bad companies. And that situation doesn't seem yet to arise. One of the most significant events in the coming year will be the transfer of power between Trump and Biden. What can we expect from the incoming Biden administration? Outside of the US, how do these changes affect European imperialism and the situation in Latin America? Claudia Sinati, an international policy columnist for La Izquierda Diario, joins us with her analysis. Yeah, there's a great expectation, especially from the allies traditional of the United States, that with the arrival of Biden to the White House, the Casa Blanca is reversed, in a large part, what were the last four years of de, de la política de Trump, que como sabemos fue una política guiada por el eslogan de America First, se enmarcaba, digamos, esa política hostil hacia eh, Alemania, hacia las potencias europeas, diciéndole que tenían que aportar más plata eh, al presupuesto de la OTAN, que Estados Unidos no iba a ser policía eh, de, de, de todos esos países garantizando la seguridad, etcétera, etcétera. Eso tiene una, un aspecto... Eh, de, de que efectivamente es, es otra la orientación, pero también tiene un aspecto de, 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 de expectativas que hay que ver hasta dónde tienen base material, ¿no? Eh, el mundo ese no existe más. Puede ser que eh, no se escuche tanto el America First, pero eso no quiere decir eh, que eh, estén dadas las condiciones para volver a una suerte de globalización más armónica. O sea, hay, hay algunos nudos de la política exterior eh, que ya se han anticipado, otros son hipótesis, uno se de acuerdo con Irán. Por ejemplo, la, la declaración de Biden es volver al acuerdo nuclear, pero no levantar esas sanciones, ¿no? Utilizarlas eh, para eh, obtener mayores, mayores concesiones e incluso sumar al acuerdo a Arabia Saudita y eh, Emiratos Árabes Unidos. Con China pasa algo similar. Biden aclara que él no está por levantar eh, las tarifas eh, que que, que impuso eh, Trump sobre eh, varias, varios bienes, digamos, de, 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 que China exporta. Es decir, que es, que, que es una presidencia que, aunque cambie la orientación, eh, se va a basar en, 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 en algunos puntos en los que la política agresiva de Trump ya avanzó. Que hay un cambio también de quienes se, se alinean con la política norteamericana, y, y algunos actores son muy importantes, por ejemplo, de la Iglesia Católica, ¿no? ya, ya vimos el, el Papa Francisco se ha alineado, digamos, hay una comunidad de intereses ¿no? con, con, con esa política más multilateral, más despolarizadora, cambian los sistemas de alianzas en América Latina, por ejemplo, Bolsonaro, este, o el propio eh, Brock Boris Johnson en, en el Reino Unido, ¿no? con el Brexit, bueno, todo, todo todo, todo ese sector, digamos, que tenía a su favor al, al, al principal, este, a la principal potencia imperialista, este, bueno, ahora no lo tiene, evidentemente va a ser, va a ser un cambio. Sobre Cuba, hay, hay, lo, que, lo que se espera es que 
Biden retome de alguna manera la, la, la política de Obama. Era una política donde, eh, a cambio de ir a, aflojando restricciones, pero manteniendo el bloqueo, se, se, se esperaba también una, una, una colaboración eh, de, de, del régimen cubano en a, eh, encarar algunos, algunos puntos que, que en particular a, a Estados Unidos le interesaba resolver, como por ejemplo... Este, el acuerdo de paz eh, en Colombia y también utilizar esa relación eh, para ir eh, manteniendo digamos un, eh, eh, un control eh, sobre, sobre la propia Venezuela ¿no? y, y es probable que Biden retome parte de esa política quizás este, con menos eh, con, con menos énfasis, digamos, en gran medida eh, Biden no tiene muchas diferencias con, con lo que fue la política de Trump, este, ambos apoyan a Guaidó que es un, y el intento de golpe. La base material eh, ha cambiado ¿no? y esa emergencia de China como competidor estratégico de Estados Unidos eh, 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 permea toda la política exterior norteamericana. La Unión Europea tampoco es la misma. Si ustedes ven la, las declaraciones, por ejemplo, de, de Macron, eh, él insiste, digamos, en que Europa, de todas maneras, tiene que avanzar en su autonomía, en su soberanía, que implica, por ejemplo, avanzar en unas fuerzas armadas comunes de todo el bloque, ¿no? O sea, que, que esas tendencias, digamos, a la, al surgimiento de nacionalismo, o sobre de mayores rivalidades entre potencias, no, no desaparece con Trump. Hacia la política doméstica, eh, lo más importante fue la constitución del gabinete económico. ¿no? Que se puede esperar, eh, por ejemplo, una política de estímulo fiscal eh, para sostener la, la, la recuperación económica eh, post-recesión de, de, de COVID y un endeudamiento, digamos, es todo un mensaje ¿no? Al que le da Biden a la clase dominante este, a las corporaciones, etcétera, este, el nombramiento de su, de su gabinete económico. ¿no? Neither the pandemic nor the economic crisis hits the imperialist countries and the dependent countries in the same way. The pandemic slump, which is what we're in now, has severely hit what uh, bourgeois economists like to call the emerging economies, although they never seem to emerge. Up to four billion people live in economies and countries which are basically have a fairly low level of income compared to no more than 20 top economies in the world which have a much higher level of income per capita. And the, so the 4 billion are really suffering way more than those people living in those top capitalist economies. Take China out of the ratio, poverty rates have stayed very, very bad for the last 15, 20 years, according to the UN itself, not according to me. Now, those poverty rates are going to get worse. Lenny wrote a book just about 100 years ago called Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. Pointed out that what seems to be happening is a concentration of all the capital and wealth and technological power in just a few countries in the Northern Hemisphere. Now, a lot of people have said since then, well, that's out of date, it's not relevant anymore. There is still a high difference between the imperialist countries and the rest of the world. And these imperialist countries have the big multinationals and the big banks, and they've been lending all the money to countries like Brazil, Argentina, South Africa. These debts are huge. What is the answer to this? Well, the answer, one very simple answer is, can the IMF and the World Bank and the G20 met only two weeks ago to discuss this question? What did they decide? They decided, well, no, we're not going to cancel the debt. All we're going to do is, We're going to not let, we don't have to pay the interest on the debt if you're very, very poor uh, for another year. This year, the working class showed its essential character, but also its precarious working conditions. It was the sector most exposed to the virus and with the fewest resources to face it. What are the current conditions of the working class and what forces does the working class have to face the coming period? And the working class is the majority class. In I think that's an important thing to, to mention to everybody. Uh, the majority of people live in towns and cities. The majority of people sell their labor and go to work for an employer in those towns and cities, in offices, in factories, in mines, and so on. 
to go back to the view that Marx and Engels had back 170 years ago that the working class would become the agents for change, it's now true that the working class has never been larger in the world. Capitalism has created a working class it's of three billion workers, uh, which is a very really powerful force. Now, the majority of those workers aren't in Europe or in North America anymore, uh, or in the uh, imperialist countries. They are in countries like uh, Central and South America, in Africa, in Asia. These are the countries where the working class is increasingly growing and becoming a force. The working class is now larger than it has ever been before and can play a powerful role in responding to the global crisis at hand. What we've seen fairly recently, even during this pandemic, is signs of struggle by that class. Only in the last two weeks, there's been a mass strike in India of 150 to 250,000 people. Most of those are rural workers or farmers, but our urban workers participated as well, participated as well. And they're trying to block the attempt of the government to take away their uh, agricultural rights, to privatize their uh, farming communities, and a whole series of other measures which basically would destroy the living conditions of uh, rural workers in India, some of the poorest people in India. And it's a massive uh, organized strike against the government. And we've seen other movements elsewhere in the world uh, with where governments are come under threat to even being overthrown. This is, and this is in the depth of a slump. Um, if there's any revival of the economies next year, I think we will see more struggle on the part of the class. So the first thing I would say is that don't give up. Uh, the working class is still a force for change. As Michael Roberts describes, the working class in India recently organized a massive general strike. In Latin America, this year has been characterized by deepening processes of class struggle and political change. What are your perspectives on how these struggles might develop? Para decirlo esquemáticamente, dos tendencias. Una que venía eh, de las luchas de abajo, como en Chile, este, como en Colombia, como en Ecuador, y otra que venía de la reacción desde arriba, como Bolsonaro, o el propio golpe este, en, en Bolivia, ¿no? Entonces, eh, digamos, la pandemia fue como una especie de, de pausa, de paréntesis. Ese respiro eh, eh, de sacar a la, a, la, a la gente de la calle eh, es, es lo que estamos viendo que se terminó. Arrancamos una situación eh, mucho más eh, comprometida desde el punto de vista de la crisis económica, de, de la crisis social, de lo que significó ser el epicentro de la, de la pandemia del coronavirus donde todas las condiciones que habían llevado a esos procesos de 2019 se han profundizado. Hay países donde eh, parece que, eh, que esa famosa frase de Lenin de que los de arriba no pueden y los de abajo no quieren, eh, este, este, se, se va manifestando de una manera este, bastante clara. ¿no? Ante eso eh, hay intentos efectivamente de desvío, siendo las menores concesiones posibles. Podríamos decir que en países... Eh, como por ejemplo Chile, eh, Perú y, y, y en cierto sentido Colombia, donde, pero sobre todo Chile y Perú, donde el neoliberalismo digamos, está consagrado en la Constitución, tienen este, un, una base material común, que son estas condiciones de, de contradicciones que vienen de antes, este, por, 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 por la pandemia, de crisis política y de la emergencia de una, de una generación que ve que, no, 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 que el capitalismo no tiene mucho para ofrecerle, no necesariamente lleve a, a, lleve a triunfos revolucionarios, pero puede abrir procesos eh, más, mucho más agudos de la lucha de clases, y sobre eso es eh, donde nosotros eh, eh, como, como revolucionarios apostamos a intervenir. The global economy experienced a severe recession this year that caused high unemployment, made countries and companies much more indebted, and increased the possibility of bankruptcies and crises, which can all affect the post-pandemic recovery. Competition between companies and the contradictions between states will become more acute. At the same time, a new government is taking office in the US, which will open up a new chapter in the dispute with China and the European powers, as well as the various other confrontations around the world. Within this framework, it is likely that the cycle of struggles and revolts that we experienced in the years prior to the pandemic will be resumed. 
the working class has the greatest potential in its entire history. It has the possibility to overcome union leaderships and conciliatory policies and offer another perspective than that of the capitalists. We in La Voice have been covering the international situation closely to put forward an anti-imperialist and internationalist perspective. We seek to advance an alternative program than that of the ruling classes, not to reform capitalism, but to truly change history and end exploitation and depression.